scripture reading today is Galatians 1. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this evil present from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of the Christ, of Christ. Sorry. What I want you, to, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see any, to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am saying is no lie. Later, I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that were in Christ. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray one more time. Father, I'm grateful for this truth that we've prayed already uh, today that your word says in our weakness, your grace is sufficient for power is perfected in weakness. That's the power of grace. God, I pray today that you would take this vessel who is weak and sinful and that your power would be perfected through him today. Your voice is the one we want to hear and we surrender to that voice and pray that you would make us obedient to it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We're looking, as you heard already, about uh, Galatians. We're in this book, and we just got started last week. And so this is a book about freedom and what it means to really live in freedom. Does anybody need some more freedom in your life? So what does that even mean? What does that look like for us today? God's gracious rescue mission for mankind. Verse 4 is sort of the summary of what this book is about. God's gracious rescue mission for mankind. Four years ago, there was a story that um, you probably are familiar with. If you remember, there were some, there was a football team in Thailand and they finished their practice. It was led by a 25-year-old coach, 12 young men, ages 11 to 16. And at the end of, the, uh, of their practice, they had this idea, let's go into the cave system of where they were located and explore. It'll be a great time of fun. 
And they just decided that let's go in for an hour, we'll come out, and then we'll head home. But it didn't turn out that way, as you know. They left practice, they made their way to the cave, and what was supposed to be fun turned into complete disaster. The monsoon rains came, and it trapped them inside. And this cave system just goes for miles underground. And they got trapped. There was no way out. And so rescue efforts began. And if you remember the story, uh, it actually took nine days for them to be found. They were found cold and malnourished. They were finally found by two elite British divers. And they were four kilometers inside this cave system. And while they were found, the problem was far from over because now they couldn't figure out how to get them out. Thirteen people that were trapped inside, they, could not, they couldn't drain the cave system. They couldn't drain the water because of the monsoons. They couldn't keep up with the rain. They could not drill down far enough. And so they finally decided the only solution was to sedate the boys, give them oxygen masks, use harnesses and ropes and take them out one by one. And so miraculously, 17 days later, all the boys in this coach came out of the cave alive. And there was massive celebration. Really, the whole world celebrated together about this rescue mission. But it came at a cost. There was actually a Navy SEAL diver from Thailand, age 38, who was trying to get oxygen to these individuals and he ended up dying in the process. And I just think any story of rescue is going to have these same components, basically three elements. There's this desperate need that I can't save myself. Otherwise, there would be no reason for rescue. I'm in a situation and I don't know what to do and I don't know how to save myself, so what am I going to do about this? That's sort of element number one. Secondly, that someone from the outside is needed and it usually will come at a significant cost. Remember 9-11, we we, we commemorated, we remembered 9-11 last week and 3,000 people were lost, but 400 of those were people who were rescuing. Rescue comes at a high cost. And then the third element is that there's this new joy, there's this new day, this new light, and so there's this sense of elation, desperate need, help from the outside comes in at a cost, and then finally there's just this sense of, I have been rescued, there is new light ahead of me, and what a great day that is. I remember years ago, Amy and I were on a trip, and in America, when it gets cold and there's a thin layer of ice on the asphalt, we call it black ice, and uh, we couldn't tell, we couldn't see, and I, we were cruising at uh, a speed that was, that was, you know, about 80 miles an hour, I'm not sure what that is in kilometers, but it was fast and it was very fast, and, and all of a sudden we lost control, and we were weaving all over the road, and in fact, somebody had, had died at that very stretch of the highway um, that same night. And we were all over the road. And I just, all I remember was this. I heard three words, and it came from Amy uh, in the passenger seat Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Only the volume was much higher. <laughs> and then, all, and then I, I remember us just sort of being guided into the ditch, going at this high speed. And then everybody, we sort of assessed the situation and drove out of the ditch, and everybody was fine. It was a miracle. And then there was this sense of, God, you saved us. Have you ever had that feeling of God just did this? It's, a, it's amazing. Well, that's what these Galatians have experienced. Paul went to Galatia, which is modern day Turkey, and he explained this very thing. You're in desperate need. You can't save yourself. Only somebody from the outside can do that. And Christ has done that for you at great cost. And now there's new life. There's freedom. You have this freedom. You've been rescued from the evil age. That's what this is about. Chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 is the, is the summary. Jesus gave His life, there's the cost, for our sins, there's the condition, from this evil age, to Him be glory forever. And ever. Desperate condition? 
We were under sin's penalty and power and you need outside help to come and save you from this condition. And so Christ gave his life and then there's this new day with hope and life. And this is the gospel. Look at this scripture in Colossians chapter 1 and how it's phrased. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. He's rescued us from the dominion of darkness. That doesn't mean that we're taking out, taken out of the world, that there's not darkness all around. Of course there is. Jesus says, I don't uh, pray that you'll take them out of the world but that you'll keep them from the evil one. So to be rescued is not to leave the evil world. It's the dominion of darkness. I'm no longer under the dominion of darkness. There's freedom from that power in my life. And Paul's own testimony bears this out. In verse 23 of this chapter, it says that he was preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. Isn't that amazing? Here is somebody who is persecuting the church, destroying Christianity, and then he becomes the greatest proponent and greatest proclaimer of Christianity in that day. And the same is true with Cephas, with Peter. He mentions Peter, that he went to go visit Peter. Peter was a crass fisherman, turned apostle, and now fishing for men and leading the church. He also mentions James, the Lord's brother. If you remember, James was a skeptic. He didn't even believe in Christ. And yet the power of redemption, the power of rescue changed his own heart and life and he becomes a pastor in the Jerusalem church. Now, what started well for these new believing Galatians now needed a massive course correction. You remember the classic line in Apollo 13, Houston, we have what? Houston, we have a problem. This is like what Paul is saying in Galatians. He's he's writing this letter and he's saying, listen, we've got a serious problem on our hands. In verse 6, he says, I'm astonished. You're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ. To live in the grace of Christ. In other words, you didn't just get started by grace. This is a lifestyle of grace. But you have reverted back to some old ways. Because grace is not only, engine, not only the engine that gets you started, it's the engine that keeps you going. It's the staying power to live by, day by day. We are called to live in the grace of Christ. It's like when you make a, a, a down payment on your mortgage. You start with this payment. What do you do? There are more payments to come. Christ does not only make the down payment, He makes all the payments. So it's not like he starts it and then we finish it. He does the whole work. This is the story of the gospel. Every day is a gospel day. My situation, I want you to really think about this. Every day is a gospel day. Not just the moment that you begin your relationship with Christ. Every day is a gospel day. My situation is dire. Every day. I need outside help. Every day. I need rescue. And only Christ can give that. I need grace. His mercies, the Scripture says, are new every morning. We're to live with this sense of need. But these Galatians, they were missing it completely. And so do we. And here's the reason why. Verse 7 tells us that these people had been receiving another message and they were perverting, or in the ESV translation, it says they were distorting the gospel. There was a distortion. They were confusing the church. And so here's the problem with living out grace. Raphael, can you be seated, please? Thank you. So here's the problem. It's called gospel distortion. We could just call it that way. Gospel distortion. It's like listening to the radio. Remember those days that you used to listen to the radio? And you would set your dial... And you got to get it just exactly right because if you go just a little bit to the right, you get distortion. If you go just a little bit to the left, you get distortion. It's got to be exactly right. And it doesn't have to be way off. Just one degree can make a difference. Did you know that one degree off for a rocket to go to the moon will end up 7,000 kilometers off of the moon? Or one degree in temperature will move you from hot to boiling 
and with boiling water, steam, you can move a locomotive. One degree makes a huge difference. And this is why Paul is so adamant and so angry at what is going on that there is another message that's coming across to these Galatians who are now set free, but now they're coming back into captivity. They're going back into a a direction that was not the gospel of grace. And so Paul is resetting the dial to get them back to the center of the gospel, the gospel of grace. Now, their gospel distortion comes with two frequencies that can sometimes mix with Christ. And so that's what I want us just to think about for a moment is, is if you think about this radio going right or left, there are two frequencies that get mixed into the gospel of grace. To the right of the dial, you can turn it to what is called legalism, just a little bit off. It's called legalism. It's the gospel plus something. And for these Galatian churches, uh, here's what they were being told. It has to do with Christ and Jewish circumcision. Keeping up with the Old Testament law, works, and the effort. This is what gets you special favor with God. But here's what the Bible says. In Isaiah, it says your righteousness is like filthy rags. You can keep working, you can keep trying to do all of the right things to earn favor with God, but in God's eyes, they're really worth nothing. I don't know if you know this story, maybe you've heard the tale of the Wemmicks. They are a small wooden people who are carved by Eli, the woodmaker. And these Wemmicks lived in a village of stars and dots. And so gold stars were given to the people who were really good. Gray dots were given to the people who were not so good. So if you could sing well, if you could jump high and you could do amazing things, well, you got a a gold star. And they gave these stars out daily. But if you couldn't do those things, then you got a gray dot. If you were chipped or flawed or really couldn't do much at all. But daily, you got your stickers. And you did everything possible to get gold stars and avoid getting gray dots. Enter Punchinello. He was completely covered with gray dots. He really couldn't do much at all. He tried, but he never seemed to achieve. He would fall, and they would give him gray dots. When he fell, he would get chipped and marred. They would give him more gray dots. The Winnick people agreed He's not really a good wooden person. And Puccinello actually believed them. But then one day, Puccinello met a person by the name of Lucia. And to his amazement, she didn't have any gold stars and she didn't have any gray dots either. She was just a wooden person. And so he was amazed because They tried to give her stickers, but they just didn't stick. When when Puccinello asked how this could be, she said, well, you need to go see the woodcarver, Eli, and find out. Puccinello was frightened. He didn't want to go see Eli, the woodcarver, but he finally got the courage to go. And sure enough, he learned from Eli that he was uniquely made. In fact, he was handcrafted. He was loved and fully accepted by his maker. And it really didn't matter what other people thought of him. He was then encouraged by Eli to visit him every day. And Puccinello realized that this was going to be the key. And so he began to hear this message day after day. And after that first visit from Eli, as he exited the wood carving shop, he looked to the ground and noticed a gray dot fell off of his person. The truth is, is this is not really a kid's story. This is the way many of you are living your life. You're living for gold stars and trying to avoid gray dots, and you're trying to earn special favor with God by the things that you do, and the truth is, is that it's already been done because you are fully loved and the grace of God. 
But we love performance. And so we turn the dial just a little bit to legalism to try to get more of God's favor. But notice what the Scripture says in Galatians chapter 5. This is what Paul is addressing that we'll hear later in, in the book. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in the slavery of the law. Don't turn the dial. Don't go back to the law. It's not freedom. So that's the moving the dial to the right. Legalism. Now here's what we can also do. We move it to the left. And that's called what we would call license. It's the gospel not plus something. It's the gospel minus something. It's the person who says, grace gives me the permission to just live the way that I want because it's all covered under grace. If it's not about gold stars and gray dots, then who really cares? I'll just do what I want to do because God is a gracious God. Well, that's the gospel minus something because there is a standard for living. It's what Bonhoeffer would call cheap grace. In other words, when you've been transformed by grace, you want to please God. There's something that happens in this freedom that liberates you to please God and to want to please God. To move the dial to the right and go towards license is what Demas did, who was with Paul. And Paul says, Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life. And so Paul addresses these Galatians. He's got an answer for this as well in Galatians chapter 5. Look at this verse. Galatians 5, verse 13. You have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. So it's gospel distortion that this book is about. It's about keeping it centered on the gospel of grace. And that's what Paul is saying. So as we think about this, just I want to, to leave you with three ways to do this. Okay, this is great. How do I keep the dial right in the middle? Where I don't move to the left towards, uh, towards license. I don't move to the right towards legalism. How do I stay dead center on the gospel of of grace. And here are three thoughts. First thought, build your life on the revelation of God's word and nothing else. God's word and nothing else. These Thailand boys as they were in the cave system, they needed outside revelation. They had no way how to get out. They had no possible solution in and of themselves. They needed somebody who knew the way out. And that's what this first chapter of Galatians is about. Listen to some of these verses that Paul writes here that you've already heard. Paul, an apostle, sent uh, not from men, nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. And then a few sentence later, sentences later, he says, I received my message from no human source. I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. God set me apart and called me by His grace that I might preach Him among the Gentiles. What is he saying? He's saying that I've got, a, I've got a revelation. You can't find your way out. It will not be by the Old Testament law. It's by the revelation of Jesus Christ that I've received. It's a message of grace. He says this elsewhere in another letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And then he goes on to say, as to one untimely born, Jesus appeared also to me. I'm least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, for I persecuted the church of God. But he was asserting his apostolic calling. In Acts chapter 26, Luke, the author of Acts, also confirms Paul's apostleship. And he says of Paul, that I have appeared to you to appoint you and am sending you. So it's from these texts that we learn what an apostle is. An apostle has seen Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, I saw the Lord on the road to Damascus. He came down to me, untimely born, because I was not one of the 12 apostles, but he came and I saw him. That's an apostle. And I, and I witnessed his resurrection. And I've been commissioned and sent just as the 12 apostles. And so he's asserting 
His apostleship. Now, here's why this is important. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 says, The church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So, this is our book. This is what we live by. This gospel of grace is what we hold on to. And nothing else. This is what we build our life on. I was reading an article last night, and I wanted to share just the first part of this article. I think it was from ABC News uh, in the U.S., and so just listen to the first part of of what this person is saying. It's talking about how Christianity is on the decline in America, and that it will no longer be the majority uh, in, in in the future. And here's the example that they start the article with. Eliza had spent her entire life as a practicing member of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. So this is somebody of the Mormon faith. She was born in Utah, and she was a resident uh, there. She belonged to the church in Utah. She She attended Brigham Young University, which is a Mormon institution that is operated by the church. It's part of your whole professional network, she said, your whole emotional community. Basically, it touches every facet of your life. So she's speaking of what it is to be a Mormon. Then, two years ago, the article says, after nearly three decades, Campbell left the church. And here's what struck my attention. She is one of a growing number of Americans who were raised Christian, but are disaffiliating from the religion. Do you see the subtlety? That Mormonism here is in the same category of Christianity. They're vastly different. And, and, and so whether it's Mormonism, it's not to pick on Mormons or Jehovah Witness or whatever, whatever the case may be, this is what Paul is saying. It's not a popular thing to say in our day because we want to just say, well, everybody sort of gets folded into the gospel. No, that's not true. In fact, Paul says, let them be accursed. I mean, that's harsh language. It's not popular language. In fact, he says, am I trying to please man by saying this? In other words, this is not going to be something that pleases men, but I have to hold to the truth. And so this is what we're saying is we build our lives on this book alone. No other source of revelation. This is what Paul is saying. Secondly, we boast in the cross of Christ and nothing else. These poor 12 boys and young coach from Thailand had nothing to boast about except the grace of others. I mean, they, they, they did absolutely nothing. They simply yielded and submitted to those who came to the rescue. And they did by faith. That's all they could do. They could only say, you must know the way out. I don't know. I submit to you. And so we boast in the cross of Christ and nothing else. The gospel of grace is ultimately about the rescuer. In fact, twice in this chapter, in in chapter 1, we see God's praise being linked in verses 5 and 24, that praise to God is linked to the gospel. Paul later says, In Galatians, at the end of the letter, look at the Scripture. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he makes this very clear to another church, and you can quote the Scripture, many of you can, but Ephesians chapter 2, he says, God saved you by His grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so no one can boast about it. So we're all in the same camp here. We all boast in the cross. That's my only hope, is that Christ has died for me. No one better, no one worse. We're all at the foot of the cross, boasting in what Christ has done to rescue us. And here's the third and last thing I would leave with you today, is that we surrender daily to the power of grace and nothing else. Surrender daily to the power of grace and nothing else. These boys simply had to cooperate. That's all they could do. In fact, they were sedated. 
they put them under so that they would not fight against the, the rescue. And so this is what, it's kind of what we do. We simply surrender to the one who's rescuing us and we do it every day. And we stay attached to our rescuer. Every day, the best I can do is surrender. I'm worried. I'm anxious. I'm fearful. I'm frustrated. I'm disappointed. I'm annoyed. I'm lonely. I'm apprehensive. I'm bitter. I'm unloving. I'm uncertain. I'm doubtful. I'm selfish. I can't change. I'm weak. What do I do? I surrender to the one who is strong. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in your weakness. Surrender. I surrender. God, let it be your life in me because that's where the power comes from. Christ surrendered to the Father. Paul surrendered to Christ as we saw in this chapter. Peter, mentioned in this chapter, surrendered. James, his brother, surrendered. I surrender. Like Punchinello, I surrender. I'm loved. I'm accepted because of what Christ has done for me. I will surrender and I will trust God to live His life through me. This week, uh, I I saw this several times. And when you know you're getting ready to speak, you just kind of keep watching for things of God that God might show you. And so we were driving a car this week that was on loan to us at the end of our stay. And I noticed that whenever I drive and I start to get out of the lane, it, it course corrects. And I'm not used to that. And it just felt strange all of a sudden for the, the steering wheel to almost just take over. In fact, this morning we were backing up and we got near a, a bush where we were backing up and it actually, the brakes went on. And it just seemed, it seemed strange. But what do I do? Do I resist that and go against it? Or do I trust uh, in what the car is doing? It's an uneasy feeling. The other day we were driving through the village where we're staying and there was a red light. It was late at night. And the light seemed to take forever. And I'm like, this is a small village. It's late at night. There's no one even around. And so what do you do? You have this thought of, go. Everything inside of you says, this is ridiculous, go. But what I learned in staying in the village now a couple of days is that red light serves a purpose because it gets to one lane around the turn and there's oncoming traffic coming the other way. And had I not heeded the red light, who knows? This is trusting. It's yielding. Or yesterday, just uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago, seeing an arborist, somebody working in a tree. And it was an amazing sight, just this little figure way up high in a tree. But I noticed he was harnessed. And so he was safe because of the harness. All of these things are images of what it is to surrender to be attached to Christ and to let Him do the work through me. And this is our closing Scripture today that we've already prayed earlier in our service. This is the key to the freedom. It's surrender. Galatians 2.20 My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live this earthly body, uh, this earthly in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. This is incredibly freeing. Incredibly freeing. Because you don't have to sort of work it up to do the Christian life. It's what Christ wants to do through you as you surrender to Him. So let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for the Gospel of grace that we rely on. We cannot survive without it. We thank You for the cross of Christ and how the cross has made a way for us. The penalty has been paid. Somebody gave His life. We deserved death because of our sin, but somebody paid that penalty for us Himself. And Lord, the cross also speaks to the power that we have because Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. And He is now our power. He conquered the grave and He can conquer what is in front of us. And so we thank You for the power of the Spirit of God who lives in us to help us overcome. Lord, so much of our life we don't feel like more than conquerors. We feel weak. 
and so needy. But I think that's the reason for the Gospel. Is that when we get to this place when we feel weak and needy, that You meet us in that place and You allow grace to take over. Lord, I pray You would keep us centered on the dial of grace. Keep us from moving to the right and going toward legalism. Toward the left and license and doing what we want. Help us to be centered on the cross of Christ and the revelation, only one revelation, Your Word, the Scripture. And as we close today, I wonder if you feel the burden here this morning of trying to live out this Christian life on your own. Maybe you're like these Galatians who you started out in grace. You know that it was Christ who got you started. But you're weary of trying to keep it going. Come back to the Gospel. Be set free again. And maybe you're here this morning and you've never really understood the Gospel. For you, it's about keeping some kind of law. It's about trying to earn gold stars or, or keep from getting gray dots. And for you, that's Christianity. And for the very first time in your life, you would like to say, I've missed it all together. This is a gospel of grace that I'm loved. I was uniquely made. And I can't save myself. But somebody came to save me. And His name is Jesus Christ. And so would you just say right now, Lord, I want to hook into You. I want to be harnessed to You. Would You save me? And that is the prayer of salvation. A new beginning. God, we thank You for this amazing grace. We put our hope and our trust in you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.